the Day of Atonement, the blessed Autumn Feast, has come. The Day of Atonement is a blessed feast that falls on the tenth day of the seventh month by the sacred calendar. Let us see its origin. When Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, after receiving the first set of the Ten Commandments, he found the Israelites worshipping a golden calf. It is written that Moses broke the first set of the Ten Commandments and put 3,000 people to death who had worshipped the golden calf. After that, the Israelites made a resolution not to commit the same sin again and offered a prayer of repentance to God, confessing their sins. Then Moses went up Mount Sinai a second time on the first day of the sixth month by the sacred calendar to receive a second set of the Ten Commandments and fasted another forty days. After Moses prayed with fasting for forty days, God gave him a second set of Ten Commandments. After receiving them, Moses came down on the tenth day of the seventh month by the sacred calendar. Today is that day. God commanded the Israelites to celebrate the Day of Atonement every tenth day of the seventh month by the sacred calendar to commemorate the time that God forgave all the sins of Israel. We kept the Feast of Trumpets ten days ago. We prayed every morning and evening during the prayer week in preparation for the Day of Atonement. Let us study the truth of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16 and realize God's abundant grace of atonement which is seen in both the Old and New Testaments. Let us see Leviticus chapter 16, verse 5. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then, he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. On the Day of Atonement, a bull was offered to God for the priests, and two male goats were offered for the people. They cast lots to designate the two goats, one for the scapegoat and the other goat for a sin offering. All the sins and transgressions committed in the past year were transferred to the scapegoat, which was then sent away to a solitary place in the desert. All the sins and transgressions that the people committed during the year were transferred to the sanctuary. Then all the sins that had been placed onto the sanctuary were transferred to the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. By this, all the sins committed in the past year were completely forgiven. This was a regulation of sacrifice in the time of Moses. Let us continue to understand this in verse 15. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take his blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he'll make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood 
and some of the goat's blood, and put it on all the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. According to the regulation of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, the scapegoat represents Satan. All the sins that we committed are temporarily carried by the sanctuary for a year, and on the Day of Atonement, they are transferred to the scapegoat, which is then released into an uninhabitable desert to die. Then, all our sins disappear. In Leviticus chapter 16, God shows us how our sins are removed. Here, who does the sanctuary stand for? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 17. In chapter 17 verse 12, it is written, A glorious throne, exalted from the beginning, is the place of our sanctuary, O Lord, the hope of Israel. The sanctuary represents God. When people sinned, the sin was transferred to the sanctuary. Likewise, all our heavy sins are passed unto God. All the sins remain on the sanctuary until the Day of Atonement. God Himself carries all our sins. When sacrificing the two male goats, one of them was to be a sin offering to make atonement for our sins. And the other was to be the scapegoat, representing Satan, the originator of sin, on which all our sins are placed. These two ceremonies were held simultaneously. The sin offering represents Christ, and the scapegoat represents Satan. All sin will be handed over to Satan in the end. Since Satan is the originator of sin, he will wander in a solitary place in the desert, called the Abyss in the Bible. Revelation prophesies that he will be sent to the Abyss in the end. Through the abundant grace of the Day of Atonement, we can realize God's love and sacrifice. God carries our sins as a sanctuary and as a sin offering. Let us understand this through Isaiah chapter 53. Let us see verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? About 700 years before Jesus came, God had the prophet Isaiah write a prophecy that Jesus Christ would carry our sins. Let us continue with verse 2. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. Doesn't this mean that Christ carried all our sins? Verse 7, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet He did not open His mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so He did not open His mouth. By oppression and judgment He was taken away. And who can speak of His descendants? For He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of My people He was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. It is prophesied that we, God's children, would require sacrifice from Heavenly Father and Mother, and that Heavenly Father would suffer all the pain that we should have suffered. Since forgiveness is mentioned frequently, we think that our sins are automatically forgiven if we just keep the feasts. However, the reason we felt lighter was because someone else was carrying our sins until they were completely removed. That someone was our father and mother. Wasn't it to show the sacrifice of Heavenly Father and Mother that countless animals were sacrificed on the altar of burnt offering for a long time of 1,500 years? We always handed over to Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother the pain of crossing the line of death like lambs to be slaughtered. We've been doing this for thousands of years. When we think about this, sincere repentance for our sins must be carried out before Father and Mother. And doesn't true repentance mean never to commit the same sin again? Let us make a list of all the sins we committed against God one by one. First, God should sit on the glorious throne in heaven. But we made Him come to this earth in the flesh. This is our grievous sin. Second, Causing God to be crucified is a terrible sin. If we had not sinned, God would not have been crucified. Next, the sin of causing God to be flogged, punched, slapped, scorned, despised, forced to wear the crown of thorns, and causing His clothes to be divided up by casting lots. We must reflect on ourselves on this Day of Atonement. Even while we were sinners, God did not give up on us, but showed how much He loved us till the end. Nevertheless, how many times a day do we find ourselves trying to leave God and taking for granted the covenant God has made with us just because we suffer a little pain? We must never be involved with these kinds of sins again. We should never regard God's precious blood shed on the cross as just some pictures or a simple scene from the movies. Instead, you and I must participate in His pain and heartbreaking sorrow.
That is why it is written in Isaiah chapter 53, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. God suffered all these things because of our sins. Instead of just saying the words, the sacrifice of the cross, and understanding it superficially, we must remember that in the exact place where we were going to suffer, Heavenly Father suffered in our stead to save us. And that every day, Heavenly Mother ascends to the altar of burnt offering whenever we sin. Through this Day of Atonement, we must never forget the love, sacrifice, and hard work Father and Mother have made for us. Let us go to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, it is written, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Here, the expression through His blood has been filtered a lot. Rather, we should understand it was through His sorrowful death that we were redeemed and forgiven of our sins. We should have paid for our own sins. However, isn't it shown through the Old Testament like a shadow that father and mother took the place of our sins? What happens every day during the morning and afternoon prayer times? In order for Heavenly Father and Mother to forgive our sins, the morning and afternoon prayer times become the time for them to shed their blood and become the sacrifices on the altar of burnt offering. This is why they become the Sabbath day offering too, and today they become the offerings on the Day of Atonement for the same reason. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No one shall separate us from the love of Christ. The reason Apostle Paul was able to keep his faith even to the point of martyrdom was because he correctly understood the sacrifice and kind of love God has for us. All the members of the early church regarded martyrdom as something natural, regarding persecution and suffering for Christ as glorious. However, when we believe in God and are faced with even a small obstacle or inconvenience in our life of faith, we try to avoid it. When we think of Father, who sacrificed because of our sins, and when we think about the grace of Him who suffered on our behalf, we can overcome any hardship trial, or persecution. Just like Paul, who said, no one can separate us from the love of Christ. We should have this kind of faith. Those who do not understand what the precious blood of Christ means easily give up and leave Christ. They turn away from Him and end up not entering the kingdom of heaven. This must never happen to us. Because of our sins, Father came all the way to this earth to save us. He walked the path of the gospel for 37 years, suffering persecution and scorn from people. And Heavenly Mother, despite her age, is still taking care of all the children of Zion around the world. Through the Day of Atonement, let us engrave their sacrifice on our hearts once again. Paul said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And Peter requested his executioners to crucify him upside down, saying, I can't be crucified upright like Christ. 
and he died hanging upside down. He was able to end his life upside down on a cross because he thought about Christ who cherished us and carried all our sins. They always thought, this pain and suffering are nothing compared with the sacrificial path God walked for us. Through the Day of Atonement, this kind of faith must develop in our hearts as well. The expression written in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, we are forgiven and redeemed through His blood, literally means that we are redeemed and forgiven through Christ's extreme sacrifice and eventual death. His blood means His death. What was going through His mind when He died? As a sheep before her shears is silent, He did not open His mouth, and He carried His children's numerous sins all alone. He never once said, I'm suffering because of you. He carried all the sins of His children silently. He walked the path of sacrifice and bore all the pain alone. Today, we need to reflect upon His deep and silent love, and we need to engrave it upon our hearts again. Additionally, we need to realize why the early church saints proudly boasted about Father to all people in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and why nothing short of martyrdom could stop them. The work we are doing is nothing like the work people do in the world. We are doing the gospel work because we have realized God's great love and grace. Only then can you carry out the true priesthood. Otherwise, it is just a job. Let us see 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We must remember, once again, that Father's sacrifice and death became the driving force that redeemed both us and our forefathers from the empty way of life. Let us go to 1 John chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. It is written in 1 John chapter 1 that God came to the earth, was crucified, and sacrificed to save us. Verse 10, This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. All the members of the early church realized this love. That is why they said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble separate us from His love? Shall persecution separate us from His love? Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. When we think about the love God demonstrated for us, how can we betray Him? 
Every year we keep the Day of Atonement. The prayer week is only 10 days, but some members feel it is difficult to participate in the early morning and evening prayer service. However, God has been carrying our sins and transgressions for thousands of years or even more. Think about this. If you think about the burden of sin God has been carrying, don't you feel that what we are doing is really nothing? That is why it is written in chapter 4, verse 9, He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. Let us see 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. He didn't just die, but He died for unrighteous people like us. To bring you to God, He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also He went and preached to the spirits in prison. Christ, who was righteous, died for the unrighteous. He took upon Himself all our infirmities and suffered for us. From the time of Moses for 1,500 years, God allowed animals to be sacrificed repeatedly year after year. Each sacrifice was to show father and mother's sacrifice. Outwardly, animals were slaughtered, but it showed the sacrifice of our Heavenly Father and Mother. When we list our sins one more time, we can see we committed the sin of making God come in the flesh, the sin of making Him shed His blood on the cross, the sin of making Him flogged, punched, slapped, scorned and despised, the sin of making Him suffer humiliation when His clothes were divided up, the sin of making Him wear the crown of thorns, and of making Him leave the heavenly glory behind. Even if we committed just one of these sins, we cannot dare come before God. However, all these things happened because of our sins. All these happen because we committed grievous sins that deserve punishment. We should have been the ones to stand in that place. But father and mother stood there instead of us. Instead of saying with our mouths and lips that we love God, we must engrave all of God's teachings deeply on our souls so that we will not betray God's love. We should be like the apostles Peter and Paul and the members of the early church who are moved by God's great love even when facing death. Like them, we should do the gospel work with thankfulness always. By this, I would like to conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.